This video introduces the proper techniques for head-to-toe assessment of infants. Using demonstrations, along with comparison to head-to-toe assessment of adults, the video highlights the need for thorough knowledge of examination techniques appropriate to each area of the body. It also demonstrates an efficient sequence of examination while acknowledging the need for flexibility in response to the infant's level of cooperation. You'll see the examiner assess a healthy infant. In clinical practice, the head-to-toe examination may reveal normal findings or variations, or you may discover abnormal findings. For safety reasons, it is recommended that pediatric examination tables be placed flush against the examination room wall. For the instructional purposes of this video, we have positioned the examination table away from the wall temporarily to provide for the clearest demonstration of examination techniques. The examination of infants differs from examinations of older children in several important ways and differs from adult examinations even more. You will find that the infant's level of development affects his or her degree of cooperation. Therefore, you must remain flexible in your approach while ensuring that both the order and the style of your examination are appropriate to the situation. To respond with flexibility, you must become thoroughly familiar with all aspects of the examination and understand how its various steps are interrelated. Unlike with older children, opportunities to engage the infant and encourage his or her cooperation are extremely limited. You can increase the chances of obtaining cooperation by considering the following tips. Try to examine infants one to two hours after feeding when they are most responsive. At this time they are neither too satiated which makes them less responsive nor too hungry which makes them agitated. Examine the infant in the presence of the parents. While this can be intimidating to even veteran examiners, parents often can help to calm a restless or screaming baby. Take advantage of such opportunities also to teach parents about their baby's natural abilities and to help them interpret the infant's nonverbal cues. Observe the parent's interaction with the baby, their bonding or their behavior during feeding, for example. Doing so gives you a chance to assess parenting strengths and to advise or instruct the parents regarding observed weaknesses. Start with the infant swaddled and comfortable. Then, as the examination proceeds, undress the infant in stages to ensure gradual stimulation and arousal. Observe transitions as the baby arouses and teach parents about them. For example, infants are often fussy during transitions. Encourage the baby's eyes to open by dimming the lights and rocking the baby or placing the baby on a parent's shoulder. Employ calming maneuvers if the baby becomes agitated. Provide a pacifier or, if the baby is not breastfeeding, a bottle of formula. Or allow the baby to suck on your gloved finger or the baby's own hand. Also try re-swaddling to silence the infant long enough to complete the parts of the examination that require a quiet baby. Mastering the techniques of the infant examination takes time, but is achievable with practice and experience. Over time, you will achieve more than just technical proficiency. You will come to understand and exemplify that hallowed medical expression, the art of medicine. In general, you will perform non-disturbing maneuvers early in the examination and potentially distressing maneuvers near the end. A typical sequence of examination that leads to minimal disruption of the baby consists of the following steps. Begin the assessment with a general survey, inspecting the patient closely, literally from head to toe, in order to form impressions for your later written assessment. Follow the general survey with an assessment of somatic growth, including height, weight, and head circumference. Then progress through vital signs. Skin, which you should observe as you go along. Head and neck. Eyes, whenever they are spontaneously open. Ears and nose. Mouth and pharynx. 
thorax and lungs, cardiovascular system, breasts, abdomen, genitalia and rectum, the musculoskeletal system, the nervous system, and finally, the otoscopic examination of the ears. During the general survey, you will observe the quality of parent-child interactions and parental discipline. You will also look for signs of stress or depression in parents, which may place the child at risk and sometimes can indicate an increased risk for child abuse or neglect. You will observe how the infant performs simple developmental tasks, such as seeing, hearing, and smiling. You will also note signs of the infant's strength and symmetry of movement, as well as unique and individual characteristics, such as skin markings and facial features. Growth is one of the most important indicators of a child's health, and deviations from normal may be an early sign of an underlying problem. When assessing growth, compare your findings with normal values according to the child's age and sex. In the first year of life, you will also adjust for gestational age. The most important tools for assessing somatic growth are growth charts. Growth charts display a series of lines that enable you to establish percentile rankings for your patients, indicating their growth relative to other children of the same chronologic age. To assess trends, plot patients' growth parameters over time. What do you think? For the infant, height is measured as body length. Direct measurement using a tape measure is inaccurate. For a more accurate measurement, place the baby's supine on a measuring board or tray, holding the patient still with hips and knees fully extended. Weigh infants directly with an infant scale. Infants should be naked or clothed only in a diaper, in which case the diaper should be weighed separately and that weight subtracted from the overall measurement. Head circumference in infants reflects the rate of growth of the cranium and the brain. Place the measuring tape over the occipital, parietal, and frontal prominences to obtain the maximum circumference. have you put them right up here we'll just check some vital signs okay for infants you'll measure pulse respiratory rate blood pressure and temperature you may have trouble obtaining an accurate pulse rate in squirming infants the best strategy is to palpate either the femoral arteries in the inguinal area or the brachial arteries in the antecubital fossa or to auscultate the heart the respiratory rate in infants has a greater range compared to adults, and in fact may vary considerably from moment to moment, with alternating periods of rapid and slow breathing. Ideally, the respiratory pattern should be observed for 60 seconds, or at least for 30 seconds, multiplying the number of breaths by two to note the rate per minute. In infants, the normal rate ranges between 30 and 60 breaths per minute. While blood pressure is routinely measured in children older than two years, it should also be obtained from infants whenever possible. Although in younger infants, the clinician faces special challenges. Just the right size for you. Select the blood pressure cuff as you would in adults. It should be wide enough to cover two-thirds of the upper arm or leg. In infants, selecting the proper size cuff is critical. Rectal temperature readings are preferred over auditory canal readings for the most accurate assessment of sick infants. Because clinical guidelines for evaluating serious bacterial infections use rectal temperature levels as a major criterion. Auditory temperatures are acceptable for the normal examination of healthy infants. Place the infant or child prone on the examining table, on the parent's lap, or on your own lap. While you separate the buttocks with the thumb and forefinger of one hand, use the other hand to gently insert a well-lubricated rectal thermometer, inclined approximately 20 degrees from table or lap, through the anal sphincter to a depth of approximately 2 to 3 centimeters. Keep the thermometer in place for at least 2 minutes. 
The average rectal temperature is higher in infancy than in adulthood, usually not falling below 99 degrees Fahrenheit until after three years, and they fluctuate as much as three degrees during a single day. As you proceed through the examination, and as opportunity arises, examine the skin of the infant carefully, first for texture and appearance. In infants, the texture is soft and smooth because it is thinner than the skin of older children. Observe also for various common skin conditions and rashes, including vernix caseosa, edema, milia, miliaria rubra, erythema toxicum, and postular melanosis. Note any birthmarks in the infant, and palpate to assess the degree of hydration or turgor. Roll a fold of loosely adherent skin between your thumb and forefinger to determine its consistency. In well hydrated infants, the skin returns to its normal position immediately upon release. Normal physiologic jaundice occurs in half of all infants, appearing on the second or third day of life, peaking at about the fifth day, and usually disappearing within one week. Pressing the red color from the skin allows better recognition of the yellow of jaundice. This infant displays no sign of jaundice. The bones of the skull are separated from one another by membranous tissue spaces called sutures. The areas where the major sutures intersect in the anterior and posterior portions of the skull are known as fontanelles. Palpate the sutures and fontanelles carefully with the baby sitting quietly or being held upright. The fullness of the fontanelles reflects intracranial pressure. On palpation, the sutures feel like ridges and the fontanelles like soft concavities. You may feel or see pulsations in the anterior fontanelle as a normal finding. Assess the symmetry of the skull. Several conditions can cause asymmetry of the skull in newborns and infants. Some are normal or benign, while others reflect underlying pathology. Next, carefully examine the face of the infant. Look for symmetry. Then concentrate on forming an overall impression of the fasces. It is often helpful to compare the face of the baby with the face of the parent. Then try to determine whether the facial features fit a recognizable syndrome. Begin examination of the infant's neck by palpating. Because the necks of infants are short, it is best to palpate them with the infant's supine. In infants, the lymph nodes are usually not palpable. However, palpation will help reveal any additional masses, such as congenital cysts, including thyroglossal duct cysts, branchial cleft cysts, or cystic hygromas. Next, check the position of the thyroid cartilage and trachea. Check for neck mobility, ensuring that the neck is supple and easily mobile in all directions. This is particularly important when the infant is holding the head asymmetrically and when central nervous system disorders such as meningitis are suspected. In newborns and infants, nuchal rigidity is a more reliable indicator of meningeal irritation than is Brzezinski's sign or Koenig's sign. Finally, palpate the clavicles and look for evidence of fracture. When assessing the infant's eyes, use subdued lighting because bright light causes infants to blink. Newborns keep their eyes closed except during brief awake periods. If you attempt to separate their eyelids, they will tighten them even more. The best way to encourage infants to open their eyes is to awaken them gently in subdued light and support them in a sitting position. During the first few months of life, some infants have intermittent crossed eyes or intermittent laterally deviated eyes. If the baby is awake, you can examine the conjunctivae by retracting the eyelids. 
Look for abnormalities or congenital problems in the sclerae and pupils. Subconjunctival hemorrhages are common in newborns and remain bright red until they resolve in a few weeks. By one month of age, an infant should be able to fix on objects such as your face and follow a bright light, provided you catch the baby during an alert period. Pupillary reactions can be observed either by response to light or by covering each of the infant's eyes with your hand and then uncovering them. Then try to use your ophthalmoscope to examine the red reflex. Failure to see a red or orange reflex may indicate an abnormality. 10 to 12 inches away is a good place to start. Back away if you're having trouble seeing the red color. Refocus the diopters to plus 15 to better see a possible cataract. When examining infants' ears, the major goals are to determine if the position, shape, and features are normal and to detect abnormalities. Note the position of the ears in relation to the eyes. An imaginary line drawn across the inner and outer canthi of the eyes should cross the pinna or auricle. If the pinna is below this line, then the infant has low set ears. While this may be normal, it may also be a sign of a congenital syndrome. Look for skin tags, clefts, or pits in the tragus of the ear. These findings sometimes are associated with other congenital deformities. Test for hearing using the startle reflex. Make a sharp noise and observe the startle response and the acoustic blink response. If, as shown here, the child does not respond to a clap, you may also test hearing by observing the child's response to a soothing voice. The otoscopic examination should be left until the end of the examination because it may be uncomfortable for the infant. During the first few weeks of life, the otoscopic examination is difficult and may detect only patency of the ear canal because of birth material in the canal. Also when visible, the tympanic membrane at this age is dull and more opaque than in older children, making middle ear assessment difficult. You will need the otoscope at this point to inspect the nose. Use a wide speculum and ensure that the nasal septum is midline. Test patency of the nasal passages by gently occluding each nostril alternately. Because infants are nasal breathers, they should easily tolerate this gentle maneuver. Do not occlude both nostrils at once, however, which would cause considerable stress. Inspection of the mouth and pharynx of infants is usually best accomplished while the child is crying. Use inspection with a flashlight, as well as palpation. You will notice that newborns have no teeth, but they may have small pearl-like cysts called Epstein's pearls along the alveolar ridges or centrally on the hard palate. Epstein's pearls disappear within one or two months. You will often see a whitish covering on the tongue. If this coating has been caused by milk, it can easily be removed by scraping or wiping it away. Try to distinguish milk from thrush, which is also commonly seen on the buccal and gingival surfaces. When attempting to examine the pharynx, you will likely have difficulty using a tongue blade because it produces a strong gag reflex. Do not expect to be able to visualize the tonsils. Carefully assess respirations and pattern of breathing. An important tip is not to rush to the stethoscope, but rather to observe the infant carefully. You can note several important aspects of the respiratory examination simply by observation.